still got to get started. I am surprised at the large group we have. I'm happy about that. Of course, it's not raining as hard as what we were told or where it is some places, but we are going to get some rain. All right. Mari. Okay, good. Good. Okay. Yes. All right. So, yeah, what I wanted to do before we start, I'm going to, I'm not going to take prayer requests, but I'm going to mention several prayer requests and then we'll pray to get started. But there are a couple of, of rather urgent matters we want to be praying for. And there's several people in the church we want to be praying for, especially with the holidays. But most of you probably know about the Hatcher family. Uh, Karen's mom uh, passed away yesterday. She had a sudden heart attack. Um, they've been visiting for a while. They sit over here, Jimmy and Karen Hatcher. So be praying for the Hatcher family. That's very difficult this time of year. She was very close to her mother. Also, let's remember to be praying for the Petties. Christina Petty, which is Olivia and Steve's daughter-in-law, has been diagnosed with uh, metastatic colon cancer, and it's not a good prognosis, so I guess she's going to start treatment after the holidays, so be, be praying for the petties. And then also uh, be praying for Lee Stoyer. Uh, he just has several things going on right now, and I told him we'd be praying for him, pray for him. And of course, Mari is recovering and did well with her procedure. Uh, John is still sick uh, a little bit, so I'll pray for him. But I wanted to also just mention, by way of just for your information and for what it's worth, uh, you know, as Christians, we do want to be praying for situations around the world. Um, certainly for the, the war in Ukraine, we should still be praying about that. And of course, the war in Israel, we need to be praying for that. Um, you know, war is a terrible thing. Many people suffer. Many people are um, affected and, you know, where this isn't the time or place. We're not going to debate the politics, who's right, who's wrong, even the morality of it. But as Christians, we do need to be praying. So how do you pray? And I'm just going to give you my thoughts on that because I have been thinking about this a lot. We know we should be praying, but how do you pray for things like this? Well, one is we should pray that the Lord's will be done. You know, the Lord's prayer says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And also in Proverbs 21, we read that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He turns it whithersoever he will. So when we pray for the Lord's will to be done, how does he do that? Well, he can do that by turning the hearts of the kings, by working in the minds of the leaders that are making decisions. We should pray that they would make decisions in tune with his will. Then, of course, we should be praying for fellow believers in these areas, um, we know there are believers in all these places where there's war. We should be praying for them. Pray for grace, pray for wisdom, pray for protection and peace. Pray that they'd be a good testimony, a good witness around them. And then we should be praying for unbelievers. You know, often it's times of extreme stress and hardship that people turn to the Lord. And we should pray they, that they would seek the Lord during these times. So that's just my thoughts and how I personally pray for these places. We don't always know. There's strong opinions and emotions on who's right, who's wrong. You know, in the end, God's in control. and We should pray that God's will be done. We should pray for those who are affected. And pray for ourselves that through this we would be good testimonies. Okay, with those things in mind, let's go ahead and start. Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for bringing each one of us here today. Lord, we're happy to be in your house. We're happy to be uh, involved in learning from your word, Lord. We want to be students of your word. We want to learn what you have for us and how you want us to live. So we thank you for giving us that opportunity. Lord, we do pray for these things that were mentioned. We pray for those with sickness especially, that you would give healing and strength and grace. We pray especially for the uh, Hatcher family for your comfort and peace and grace to be upon them during this time. And we pray for the Petties also as they have bad news. And we pray that you would give them peace and comfort and guidance and wisdom going forward. That you would help them today. 
And we pray for Lee Stoyer. Lord, you know his needs. And we pray for a grace for him and strength and healing. Pray you'd bless him today. And Father, we do pray for those that are affected by these wars in Ukraine and in Israel. Or it's hard for us to really understand as we live in a place of relative peace. Uh, we pray, Lord, that your will would be done. We pray that you would work in the minds of those making decisions, that uh, they would make decisions that are according to your will. And Lord, we do pray for believers in these areas that you would give grace and strength. We pray for their protection and their peace. And pray that you would help them to shine as lights for you in these places. And then we pray for unbelievers, Lord, that through these difficult times of war that many would consider their spiritual needs and look to you and to seek you out. Father, help us to uh, strive to have the mind of Christ as we consider these things. Father, we just ask for your blessing as we um, look into your word. We pray you'd give us insight, understanding, or help us not just for our knowledge, but that it would change us and help us to live for you and to be more like Christ in, uh, day by day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we are in 1 Samuel 7. Oh, by the way, does anybody know what country this flag represents? It is not Ukraine or Israel or Palestine. It is Ghana. Ghana. Well, you cheated because I told you. <laughs> Ghana, West Africa. It's just a reminder that Beverly and I are going there again in January. I think we leave on the 7th, 6th or 7th or something like that for two weeks in Ghana, medical ministry there. So asking you to pray for us. That's why that's there. Yes? Um, I was thinking more that um, the Ghana president, um, Uh, homosexuality beliefs. Yeah, we don't care whether or not you send anything to us or not. So there's absolute praise the Lord for such a wonderful work he's doing. Yeah, a lot of the African countries still have it straight when it comes to those kind of things <laughs> and aren't bending. Okay, First Samuel 7. All right, today we're going to emphasize, the Bible emphasizes Samuel as his role as a judge. Okay, remember we said that Samuel is going to, as we study him, he serves as a judge. He serves as a, what else? Prophet. And he serves as priest. We'll see, especially when the time comes for selecting a king, he serves as priest. But here we will emphasize Samuel as judge. So let's look at uh, the end of verse of chapter 6. And just for review, we're going to read uh, verses 20 to first verse of chapter 7. So 620. And the, and the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God, and to whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiriath-Jerim, saying, the Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. Then the men of Kiriath-Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. So you remember from last week that uh, it was returned to the land of Israel, but the people of Beth Shemesh, they were judged by God for their inappropriate handling of the ark. And then so now the ark is moved to kiriath Jerem into the family of Abinadab, where it would be for a long time, and we'll talk about that. So question, why wasn't the ark moved back to the temple in Shiloh, or the tabernacle in Shiloh? That's where the tabernacle was. Remember, that's where Eli was. That's where Samuel was raised, in Shiloh. Why wasn't it moved to Shiloh? Well, we can't be sure of the answer, but most people think, well, Shiloh was probably destroyed back in chapter 4 when the Philistines had great victory over the Israelites and got the ark. We assume the tabernacle and Shiloh was probably destroyed. So they, we surmise that's why it was moved then to Kiriath-Jerim. Okay, and in review, what was the significance of the ark? What did it represent? God's presence with them and his blessing and deliverance, right? That's, that's what it represented. What did it not 
what was it not? A lucky charm. It wasn't a, right? It wasn't a guarantee of success, was it? Remember what happened in chapter four? Chapter four. They had the ark, and yet they were soundly defeated by the Philistines. So those are the things it was not. But what was, what was essential in regards to the ark? What was the, the missing piece? They had the ark. What was missing? Yeah, it was their response to it, right? It, it, was the, it was essential that there was submission, that there was obedience to the God of the ark, right? It's kind of like what uh, Pastor Dan was talking about with the land promise to Israel. It was, it was conditional. There is two-way street. Jesus, uh, God guaranteed this if, right? And that was the part that was missing for all those years. Israel had really fallen into a very lax state, which was really represented by the, the corrupt priesthood right, of Eli and his sons. So that's what was missing. So let, let's look at verse 2 there of chapter 7. So it was that the ark remained in Kiriath-Jerim a long time. It was there 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. All right. So 20 years. Now, there's a little, to understand this, and this was mentioned uh, last week, but the ark is actually going to stay in Kiriath Jerem for about 100 years. It's until, until David moved it to Jerusalem, and that's in 2 Samuel chapter 6. So it actually was there 100 years. So why does it say 20 years? Well, the idea of the 20 years is that it was there 20 years, and Israel was lamenting, then Samuel spoke. So after 20 years of being in Kiriath Jerem, that's when Samuel spoke up, and that's really the first recorded public ministry of Samuel. So that's, it wasn't that the ark was only there 20 years, but after 20 years, that's what happens in verse 3. And it says there that for 20 years, Israel lamented after the Lord. And lamented, the NIV says they mourned and sought after the Lord. That's the idea, is that they were starting to understand that they had, they had, been, they had fallen away from the Lord and the people were starting to turn back. Now, why 20 years? Well, it really shows us that these changes don't happen overnight. <laughs> Sometimes it takes time for God to work in their hearts. Isn't 20 years just a different generation? Yeah. yeah, could be. It could have been that all the old people that had turned from the Lord had to die off. Yeah. But anyway, 20 years, and it says that they, they mourned and sought after the Lord. Then, verse 3, then Samuel spoke. So not until that 20 years of lamenting, mourning, seeking the Lord, then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel. And as we're, well, let's go ahead and read verse 3. So then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you, and prepare your hearts for the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel challenged them to prove their loyalty to God by abandoning the foreign gods and turning to the Lord. Now, just as kind of a way of information, why does it say put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths? Does anybody understand the distinction between the two? I certainly didn't until I researched it, so maybe we'll learn something. So it says the gods and the Ashtoreths. The idea there is that the gods... Were, that referred to Baal and other Canaanite nature deities, and these were always represented as male. So these are the male gods, the Baal being the primary one and the other nature deities. The Ashtoreths, on the other hand, are the goddesses. That represented the female goddesses who were the fertility deities. And in the pagan culture there in the Philistines and other countries, the idea was that somehow... Mystically, these male gods would, would mate with the female goddesses, and that's what provided fruitfulness and the rejuvenation of nature, and that's what provided the seasons. It was these gods and goddesses mating up there somewhere, and that produced the rain, rainy season, dry season, and all the seasons coming. So that's why when he says put away the gods and the asterisks, he's saying all of them, the male and female. So that's why they're listed separately. That Beverly mentioned to me, she says, is that like the Asherah pole? Remember we read other people, Asherah was one of the Ashtoreths. Asherah was one of the female goddesses, and they represented her with a pole, and that's, why, that's where the Asherah pole came from. 
So the idea was that he was saying if, if the Israelites heeded Samuel's challenge, there was a promise of deliverance from the Philistines. And here Samuel is functioning as a judge. Remember, the judge were the deliverers. They're the ones that kind of got Israel back on track, and then God could deliver them, Samuel being the last judge. But I want to look a little bit more closely at Samuel's admonition. And I want you to study that, what he had to say to him in verse 3. And we find four parts to his admonition. I want to list those on the board and make some comments about those. What is the first? Return. return. Okay, return to the Lord. All right, let me, you got to be thinking a little bit. So on each one of these, I want you to think, is this an inward action or an outward action? What would you say about returning to the Lord? Is that more inward or outward? That would be inward. Okay, what's the second one? Put away. Put away all the gods. Now, is that an inward or an outward? outward? That's outward. That's something that you can see. And really, wasn't that the besetting sin of the Israelites? I mean, the foreign gods, that was always part of their problem. They were always wanted to be like the others. All right, what was the third one? Prepare your hearts. Heart. And obviously, what's that? That's inward. All right, and what's the last one? Okay. Serve God. And yeah, I'm glad you mentioned only. That's a key word. It wasn't just serve him, it was serve him only, and that would be an outward. Because you can actually see, make, there are actions that look like you're serving him. So inward is to return to the Lord and prepare your hearts. Outwardly is to put away and to serve. Now, Look at verse 4. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. So what, what are the ones that they, they did, obviously? Well, the outward ones, right? And that's good. So they were obeying, at least outwardly. But were they obeying inwardly? Well, that's the big question, right? That's, that's, that's the important part. And isn't this exactly what Jesus condemned the Pharisees about? right? Outwardly, they were doing good things, all the right things, but the problem was inward, right? They, they, they ignored mercy and justice and those kind of things. And notice that what the inward, generally speaking, that, that's what leads to this, right? It's returning to the Lord makes you put away. Preparing your heart causes you to serve him only. So they were taking the right steps. They were doing the, inward, the outward, right? But were they doing the inward? Well, we assume, but we can't, we're not told. Any thoughts on that, the difference? Of course, God is interested in right, well, both, but particularly the inward. Because if you get the inward right, usually the outward follows, right? But you can, can you have the outward without the inward? Yeah. Well, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we see it all around us, right? I mean, that's the, the bo checking the boxes. Okay, let's look now at what happens in verses 5 to 9. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Now when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Okay, so verse 5, they gather at Mizpah. Now Mizpah is between Shiloh and Jerusalem, roughly in the middle. And it was actually a common place of assembly for the, for the Israelites. If you, as you read through the judges, you'll see several times they met at Mizpah. And in fact, when, when Saul is presented as the first king, that's at Mizpah. So Mizpah was a common meeting place. Probably geographically, it was central, and it offered some benefit for all the meeting of the Israelites. And in verse 6, we see that they did the ceremonial rituals, the outward, right? which we don't want to neglect. 
But what happened in verse 6 that is key to understanding what's, what's happening among the Israelites? What's that? Yeah, confession of sins. He said, we have sinned against the Lord. It's easy to read over that and say, okay, then, but this is, this is big because this is exactly what Samuel was telling them. He said, you have to have an inward change. And it says there they confessed their sins. And that's an indication that of inward obedience. And that tells us that they are starting to change the inward. And that's what had been missing in, in Israel, right? That's what exactly what had been missing for a long time now before Samuel is that there was no inward change. There was no repentance for their sin. And then it says right after that, then Samuel judged them there. So now Samuel was able to do the work that God had called him to do because they, there was this change taking place. Now, what did a judge do? Now, this is all very confusing, especially for children to understand a judge. Because when we think of judge, we think of a courtroom and a guy sitting up there. But that's not exactly what the Israelites' judges were. What, what were some of their jobs? What did they do? Teaching. That's, they, they were to teach the law. They were to, they were to judge. They were to hear cases. They were to pass judgment, to vindicate or punish. They were to give counsel. They were to govern in general. Remember, there's no king. There's no, no really leadership. So they, be, they became the governing authority. And he's, it says that he did that there in Mizpah. Now, how long were they there? Well, we're not told. And I, I, was it a week? Was it a month? Was it six months? We don't know. But he did the job of the judge while he was there at Mizpah. Then at verse 7, remember this is before telephones, telegram, and internet, but sooner or later the Philistines get word that all these Israelites have been organized and they're there doing some kind of religious activity. And how do they feel about it? They didn't like it, right? So they prepare for battle because that's what Philistines do. <laughs> if you don't like something, you fix it militarily. But then what do we read about the Israelites at the end? How did they respond to the Philistines preparing to attack? They were afraid. Why were they afraid? <laughs> yeah. And really, at this point, Israel had no standing army. They did not have an organized military, and there was no military leaders. Remember, Joshua was long gone. Some of the judges were more military. Samuel wasn't. <laughs> he, was, he had been raised, raised in the tabernacle. So they didn't have a leader militarily. Now let's look at verse 8. It says, so the children of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God. Now, who did they cry out to? Samuel. Why not the Lord? Okay, they're afraid of him. Shows their waywardness, right? They still, even though they're coming around, they don't have the relationship to God as a people that they once had under, under Moses and Joshua. So they're estranged from God. So they, they say, Samuel, cry out to God for us. In a way that's bad, it shows they didn't have that relationship, but it's good in that they're recognizing Samuel as their spiritual leader. And they really understood that, hey, this man has a connection. Yes. They say, "Our God, yeah. cry out to the Lord. Our God's food. Oh, yeah. that much progress." Oh yeah. No, it's good. But yeah, they realize that. Yeah, like you said, they had lost the last battle. They were like, "Who are we to ask for this?" Karen, did you have a? Well, I was just thinking that part of it could be that is our natural impulse is to reach to someone we can see. To reach to you know another human, well, and and you know that is natural. And Samuel was the best one they could have. But um, it's a good it's a good thought, and that that probably explains why some religions are very popular. Because thinking of the Roman Catholic religion, because there is a person that that you could see and go to and actually talk to. Can't see him because of the screen and the confessional, but he's there, right? So that's a good point. 
and that they were not worthy of it. Exactly. exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, they're, they realized that they, they didn't really have good standing yet to call upon the Lord. So they call unto Samuel and say, Samuel, pray to the Lord our God and help us. So Samuel intercedes there in verse 9, and what are we told at the end of verse 9? The Lord answered him. All right. All right, let's read verses 10 to 12. Now, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as below beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. These are great verses. So the Philistines approach Israel, and how does God defeat the Philistines? With thunder. Thunder. Now, we all know the impact of thunder. If you've ever been in a storm, especially if it's right above you, and it's, I mean, thunder can scare you, the wits out of you, right? Sh shake the ground. But it's interesting that God used thunder. There's no mention of lightning, which, you know, we understand, I guess, that Thunder and lightning go together, right? It's the lightning, at least is the way I understand it, the lightning causes the thunder. It's that, and usually you see the lightning first if it's far off because light moves faster than sound. So you see the light, hear the thunder. There's no mention of lightning. So does that mean there wasn't lightning? I guess not. I mean, God, this is obviously a supernatural event. Interestingly, you know, the main god among the Philistines was Baal. You know what he was? He was the storm god. <laughs> Isn't that ironic that God used an element of storms, but in a supernatural way, to defeat them? And it says that they were overcome, they were confused. The NIV says that it threw them into a panic. <laughs> it overwhelmed them. And then we read that Israel drove them back, and that literally means they struck them down. So God gave a great victory, and it was very obvious that God was doing this, right? <laughs> no one else could bring the thunder. So what a, what a wonderful way God answered their call and delivered them from the Philistines. And then we read that Samuel commemorates the event by placing a stone. Now, what does Ebenezer mean? And don't say Scrooge. Okay, <laughs> I know. <laughs> huh? The stone of help. Ebenezer means stone of help. And that's why he named it, because God, hitherto as the Lord, helped us. Now, what is the significance of the stone? Why did Samuel set up the stone? And this shows why he was a good spiritual leader. What was he, what was he saying? It was, it was directing the praise to God, right? The purpose of the stone was this stone points to heaven, showing that God delivered us. Now, why a stone? Exactly. 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 He wanted it to be a memorial for many, many, many years. Yes? Yeah. Oh, there's many times we read that they set up a stone, but it's interesting, stones. Why, uh, why not cut down a tree or something? But they wanted it to last. I know when we bought our house after we got married, Beverly and I, we bought a house that had no landscaping, so I had to do the landscaping, which... That was not my thing, but I designed it, and I used a lot of rock, a lot of stone, because I knew once I put it there, it's done. I never have to do it again. Stones last, and that's why they use stones, because they wanted to be a memorial to future generations. So it really tells us a little bit about Samuel. He was a great spiritual leader. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, a lot of the, uh, the gods rep were represented by wood. That's right. So stone. Yes. Yeah. That's right. It was a rough cut. Yeah, they didn't do anything to the stone. They just set it up. Yeah, that's a good point, too. But yeah, it was a mark to that that would last. Okay, let's go ahead and read 13 and 14. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Then the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron to Gath, 
and Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines. Also, there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. So, we see here that the cities there that it mentions. So, the Philistines are subdued. That It ended their occupation of Israel. But this was just for the time being. It mentions the whole life of Samuel. So we do know that they later would harass Israel again. But for the time being, God got rid of the Philistines. And then we're told that the cities or towns were restored to Israel. And you see those on the map, Ekron and, and uh, Gath there. And then we're told at the end of verse 14 that there was peace with the Amorites. Now the Amorites were the, the hill dwellers in the south of Canaan. So they were further south. They were the ones that lived in the mountains. But it said that also they, get, they, they obtained peace with the Amorites. And I thought, why is that in there? And it's kind of like, well, this is kind of a byproduct of what God did for them. And I immediately thought of a verse that we talked about from Proverbs. Those of you that have been coming Sunday night, in Proverbs 3, you remember the two verses that say, honor the Lord with your possessions, the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be full and your vats will overflow with new wine. And we said that my interpretation of that at least was that that meant if you honor the Lord the way you should with your possessions, he will fill your barns. He'll, he'll make sure you have what you need. And then the, your vats will overflow with new wine was the idea of extra blessings, that God will even sometimes give you extra blessings that you weren't even looking for. And this is kind of what happened here. So they they were, they were following after God. They were, do, they were obeying what Samuel had told them God wanted them to do. He, he subdued the Philistines, and he also gave them peace from the people in the south. That's the way God works sometimes, isn't it? Doesn't he often give us over and above what we, what we need? Yes? The verse says that even our enemies enjoy a peace. Yep. Yep. So that just shows you God is a good God. He wants to bless us. But uh, sometimes, you know, it doesn't come until we obey. Okay, then verses 15 to 17. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He went from year to year on a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and judged Israel in all those places. But he always returned to Ramah, for his home was there. There he judged Israel, and there he built an altar to the Lord. And that's in this next picture shows you that circuit. So Samuel continued to judge Israel, and he did it in a circuit of towns there, and that's about a 50-mile circumference. <laughs> circuit judge. That's right, exactly right. The first circuit judge. His home, what we're told, was in Ramah. That was his home base. That's where he built an altar. So what a, a, a testimony to the work of Samuel. And I often think of Samuel as kind of one of the unsung heroes of the Old Testament. I mean, he certainly was used by God, but think of how he was used by God. What did God provide through Samuel? Well, first and foremost, he provided spiritual leadership, and that's what was missing in Israel. You know, and many times now in the prophets, God really lays it out that you know, he set up the priesthood, and leaders, but they just failed miserably, and that they, they were weak. So God is providing spiritual leadership, and he's really providing the political or national unity in that the people were now rallying and getting back to their roots of serving the one true God and enjoying his blessings. So that's what Samuel is doing as judge, and what a great ministry he had. Okay, any comments, questions about those things? Yes. It's like we have it so backward. We have separation of church and state, which I don't think is for far. They're really truly desired. And because our leaders are not godly people, the whole nation is being swayed away from the Lord. But it just shows the importance of praying for a good spiritual leader, a godly man. Not just a godly man, but a man handpicked by God to lead the nation. I mean, we truly are blessed in that this nation was built on biblical principles. I read an article just yesterday where some very prominent leader said, you know, the foundings of our, of our uh, country never really meant for this to be a Christian nation. <laughs> really? <laughs> 
Right, you could, that, that you could say, but he, he was saying that, no, they didn't really intend it to be. We went astray in pushing the Christian ideal. Well, no. And, you know, I do think that's why God has blessed our country. Unfortunately, we are getting away from that. But, all right, let's go just mention this again about the inward and the outward. Why are people so drawn to those religious systems that, that push the outward? Right. Exactly. Right. I'm a big list maker. I love making lists. And the reason I love making lists is because I love checking them off. I, sometimes I'll just have two or three things, and I know I can remember it. But I'll still make the list because I like at the end of the day to check off the box. And, and that's human nature. And say, I did it. I'm good. But man, that's so unbiblical. You know, it's so unbiblical because God is interested in the heart. He really, and if, if our heart is right, of course, the outward will follow. That's the whole idea of faith and works. So, yeah, and, and so we do want to always keep in mind you know, it's the inward. And that only comes with fostering your relationship to God, feeding it, right? Yes? I already have the whole point of the new covenant. It's not me and me for a heart to stand out. Exactly. Me for a whole heart. And so his spirit in us is how we want to embrace him. You know, without the new covenant promises, the new birth, it's just a matter of religion. Sure. It's just outside. Sure. Yes. Sure. And that was part of the Old Testament system, right? But at that stage, they really couldn't. I mean, they probably didn't know how to cry out to the Lord. It's like, you know, but it just shows that as a nation, they were, the, the, they were turning the corner, so to speak, and getting back to God. Yes. You can't talk. You're on the wrong side. No. <laughs> I find it a little bit interesting that the inward and the outward things, that uh, it's interesting that sometimes if you begin to try to do some of the outward things, like say, well, I'm going to read my Bible, you'll find that we find that, hey, all of a sudden our heart gets spoken to, so it works on the inward part, and then say, hey, well, I'm going to try to go to church, and hey, you might all of a sudden hear something that really speaks to you. So it's kind of, can also be tied together. Mm -hmm. a lot. But let me, let me just say this because, you know, when, when reading, you're right, we read the Bible, the God's Word, that's how we know His mind. But we need to read for understanding. I mean, I've talked to people that say, oh, yeah, I read my chapter every day. But then, you know, I say, well, do you understand what you're reading? Well, not really. And, um, and this, got, this led to a uh, talk about the different versions. They were of a bent that there was only one version you could read. And I said, well, do you understand? He said, oh, I don't understand any of it, but I read it. And I thought, well, that, I, don't, I think that's exactly, you're just checking a box. You're not reading for understanding. You're not seeking to foster that relationship with the Lord. So yeah, it's reading is good, but it's got to be reading for understanding. Yeah. There are a lot of religions that read, read the Bible. <laughs> But, uh, yes, Sandy. We want to stand proud and say, I did this thing. Mm -hmm. And the opposite is faith, because faith means that you're going to lower yourself and you're going to say, God, you know. So I think our nature is, is to work. Sure. Our nature wants to do the work. And, and God made us that way. We're made in the image of God. But it's got to follow the faith. You're right. Frank? Do you have a comment? About how the people of God kept going back to these these idols, and they had seen the power of God, and yet there was some attraction to these things that kept drawing them back in, and they wrecked these things over and over again. And um, I was like, what could have been that? But then I reflected on our own lives, and I think about how simple these little deceptions, whether whatever we're giving our attention to, whether it's our television, our phone, our sports team, our 
outdoor event, you know, whatever it may be, it becomes more important than my relationship with him. And when I give it the attention that's demanding from me, I start to drift away. Right? And it gets a picture of us returning back to it. <laughs> yeah, it's a lifelong struggle. Yeah, doesn't matter how much you grow as a believer, there's always that tendency. Rick? Um, it's amazing how the Lord, I mean, when you read the history, um, how the, the, the Lord saved Israel from the Philistines mm -hmm. so many thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, we look at him, we look at now the wars that we're having, the armaments that we're having, I mean, things that man created can destroy human kind just an instant. But the Lord protected till now. I mean his you know, Israel is like his his children he says that. And the people I'm sure that hundred percent of the people are not following him. But we outside we're watching this and we're like, oh, how can that be? You know, Satan Satan has caused havoc all throughout the world. And the Lord is protecting His people in mean, a small island, mm -hmm. and and we're we're watching how the Lord has so much power and mm -hmm. control of that, and He's going to sustain that until He comes back. Mm -hmm. And we outside, we talk about oh, okay, the inward, the outward, and the things that we can deal with. Mm -hmm. And when we're not in the war right now, well, we are in the war right now, mm -hmm. inwardly, as Satan attacks us, mm -hmm. and. Um, we thank, I thank God, we thank God that that Holy Spirit, His Word, is just sustaining this world. Mm -hmm. yes. when, when we were studying about how he <coughs> showed himself strong in front of Dagon, and showed himself strong and afflicted with plagues, and I was just like, why did he, they, they, they even conducted an Hashem, a guilt offer to the Lord. They, it was like they knew, but they didn't want to follow. And it's just like he was saying about, I mean, and it's like what Jesus said, you know, narrow is the gate that leads to life. Narrow. And why is that? It's because all the other things are so appealing. Mm -hmm. It's because they have such a pull and a drive, and it's easy. It's the easy way. Yeah. Well, and with, of course, in our culture, materialism, of course, that's the biggest problem we have as far as idols. So I think that's very well represented by the trouble they have with idols. Okay, well, we need to cut it off there. But consider those things. And, uh... Continue next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that you interceded for your people back in the day of the Philistines. And Lord, it does demonstrate your power. It also demonstrates the, your desire for us to know you and to serve you. And Lord, that uh, we can look to you and trust you. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful to you. Help us to be faithful in our uh, relationship with you and in promoting that and be willing to say no to other things that would draw us away from you. So we thank you for your word. We pray your blessing as we continue to fellowship together and worship and hear your word preached today. In Jesus' name, amen.